All right, guys, so right now, Billy Harris, my peak performance coach, is going to give a presentation, but I first wanted to share with you why myself as a business owner, I decided to get his help. Well, I mean, obviously, one kebab, one bang, I mean, you know what it does to you as a human being, right? Like, it doesn't really allow you to think straight. And also, like, my wake-up times were, like, at 11 a.m., and the difference it made for me was in the quality that I could think, right? Better sleep, better diet, starting to exercise, and that makes a huge difference. So even though like they're very basic things, as a business owner, you need to be able to think clearly, right? Because you're leading and steering a team. So that was the big change that I got from like working with Billy and why I invited him to come on today to basically present. So uh, that is the reason why and how it too can benefit you as a business owner with what he's gonna be showing you. So don't think it's gonna be like a generic cut or fitness plan that you can find online. It's gonna be like really, you know, um, in depth in terms of peak performance, and this will 100% benefit you. So, with that being said, give it a warm up. Mr. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll give you guys a little bit of context first. Um, so, in terms of my background, I was a personal trainer working in central London, and I realized very quickly that other people operating businesses in central were burning themselves into the ground pretty quickly by doing, you know, copious amounts of drugs, caffeine, etc., whilst trying to obviously gain more profit and revenue in their businesses. And uh, I came to the conclusion as a result of watching the likes of Gary Vee that this wasn't going to happen moving forward and uh, something needs to change pretty quickly. Uh, and therefore, I started working with individuals like Bass to obviously optimize their health whilst they operate their businesses. So the premise very much though is to apply a metric-based approach to obviously improve quality of health and longevity long-term and energy on a daily basis. And uh, I've had the opportunity now to work with plenty of very, very cool people, including Bass, of course. But uh, I thought I'd give you guys a few examples first. So obviously Bass, uh, Dan and Bass worked with him and his team for about how do we turn that off? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the TV, bro. Is, have you, is the remote here? Oh, is this it? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, so I had the opportunity to work with people like Dan Vass as well, who's big in the e-commerce education space. That's me and him in Toronto when I was working with him and his team. Worked with him for about two years. Um, obviously, Oriol Vinga, another guy in the e-commerce space in Spain specifically, very cool guy. Eman, I worked with him in person for three years. Every single day at 5, 5.30 a.m. I was at his house. So I'll talk to you guys about that experience and obviously what I learned from him. So when I first met him, he was 17 years old and he's doing videography and content work for a guy called Shan Hanif, who now runs Genflow, which is a very successful influencer business. And uh, he's obviously translated down to the success he's achieved now, but we were working together and he's doing like 50K a month all the way up to 500K a month. So I got to see a lot of the behind the scenes, which is pretty cool. I thought I'd give you guys some context on that as well as the health habit aspect of that also. Um, yeah, Angus Foss, Cosgrave, another individual. Guys in the software space now, as you can see here from that payment processor, 15K, uh, 15 million a month there, which is kind of nuts. So I've learned a lot from people like this also. He's 27, which is kind of crazy. Uh, Tyler, a good friend of mine, obviously a person in the UK, is doing very well from the education space. Cole Gordon and Mitchell Miles worked with them for a bit also. So um, getting context for, of course, their, their life and obviously the metrics and how that applied there was really, really interesting. Um, other individuals that are big in the education space, Billy Wilson, Mickelson Twins, other guys you may recognize, Lenny Banks as well. It's been, it's been a cool experience for sure. And um, I've learned an awful lot and I've tracked about 650 client sleep metrics now, gut health tests, everything. So uh, I thought I'd break it down for you guys into five blocks and make it fairly simple, just as an oversight first. And of course, we can open up into any questions you guys have from there, if that sounds good. Works well? Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, first and foremost, how many of you guys actually track your quality of sleep in this room? I've seen a few aura rings. Okay, cool. And I'm curious, what made you track your sleep quality? Was it Sam Ovens that kind of indoctrinated you into that? Who, who kind of led to that? You. Really? Yeah. Okay, cool. Anyone else? What led you guys buying an aura ring? Say again? I have a whole lot of five You don't use it? Okay, cool. Okay, interesting. Um, so I'll, I'll dive into some metrics. And uh, yeah, I'll show you guys obviously the utility of this tool. So this is actually Bass's metrics. I get asked him for permission earlier to share this. He said yes, that's good. Um, as you can see here, that's an 100 readiness score, which is just totally uncommon and really rare, but it's a really good example for, for yesterday, which is cool. Um, so I, I pay attention to a few key variables when tracking an individual's sleep, and I'll dive into them, break them down step by step. Um, arguably, the key initially is very much those sleep start and end times, as Bass referred to already. So as you can see here, obviously in this instance, Bass went to sleep at 11.45 and woke up at 9.32 a.m. 
And uh, what I track with my clients I work with is their consistency with this, because it's definitely the, the primary variable which determines sleep quality um, overall in the coming days and weeks, of course, that I work with them. Um, in, in this instance, also, we're planning for, a, generally speaking, about nine hours of sleep duration. As you can see, Bass spent eight hours and 57 minutes asleep here in this instance. And his awake time is only 50 minutes, which you guys can see here, showcased with these gray blocks. That's actually pretty low. Most individuals' awake time is about one hour 30, maybe two hours on a daily basis, start knowing it. So, of course, most individuals haven't tracked their sleep quality. They're not aware of the fact they're actually awake. They're not conscious of this. And therefore, their sleep quality is in the gutter. And therefore, cognitively, of course, they can't perform particularly well. They can't recall memories particularly well, nor communicate, nor deal with emotional variability very well either. These are really key variables. Um, other variables we pay attention to and other metrics are REM sleep. Do you guys know what REM sleep is? Any, any idea of that? OK, say again. Somewhat, somewhat. It's kind of a misconception. There's two variables we pay attention to. So REM sleep specifically is responsible for cognitive function and memory recall. And therefore, in this instance, BASS's is 2 hours 51, which is actually very, very high. Most individuals, again, specifically male clients I work with, their REM sleep is about 30 minutes per night initially. It's appallingly bad. And as a result of that, they can't particularly function well cognitively, let alone focus on their work-related tasks, which sucks. And of course, our objective very much so is to increase that. And I'll dive into that in a second. As you guys can see here, majority of REM sleep, about 75% in duration or total, is acquired in the last 25% of a sleep duration, okay? And therefore, if you guys are spending six hours in bed, you're basically castrating yourself of this entire time period, which means as a result of that, you're gonna feel pretty crap, but in terms of your emotional well-being, cognitive function, memory recall, it's not great. And therefore, it's an absolute priority, okay? Another variable we pay attention to is deep sleep, which is responsible for physical repair and recovery. And effectively, of course, in this instance, how well you're going to feel physically when it comes to training, energy, etc., on a daily basis. Most individuals naturally acquire enough deep sleep, about one hour 30 on a daily basis. The variable which most individuals suffer with, have difficulty with, is definitely REM sleep. And therefore, that's a massive focus of ours, both when it comes to improving sleep duration and also efficiency and quality. Again, I'll elaborate upon that later. Other things we look into are latency. As you can see here, Bass fell asleep in nine minutes. That's what latency describes, which is pretty good. And of course, we're also looking at heart rate variability here in terms of fluctuations throughout the night. Now, this looks like a load of squiggles and therefore won't necessarily be able to extract much information from this. But actually what that tells us is his sleep start and end times are so consistent to the extent where his circadian rhythm is very, very well aligned, meaning hormonally he's functioning very, very well, which is great. So first thing upon waking, he's not going to feel lethargic, foggy, like he can't particularly operate very well, as, as opposed to most individuals that do so because their heart rate hasn't actually spiked prior to bed nor is their body temperature. So again, that's a really key variable to pay attention to. <laughs> um, other variables when it comes to further health complications would be respiratory rate. As you can see here, Bass taking approximately 14 breaths per minute. Uh, most individuals that I work with that are somewhat overweight or aren't particularly lean, their respiratory rate's a lot higher. And therefore, generally speaking, it's very much indicative of the fact that they're mouth breathers, not nasal breathers, which does impair their sleep quality as well. So our objective with those guys is to get them to lose weight very quickly, improve their body composition, and also incorporate mouth breathing tapes, which I don't know if you guys have seen. Not particularly comfortable at times, but nonetheless really important. Um, when it comes to readiness, of course, this is, a, this is a great score. I mean, it's very rare that I see 100 readiness. I think I've seen it twice, so hats off to you, Bass. Very, very cool. Maybe you just tricked the, just for yeah, no, I've actually just played with the algorithm. Yeah, yeah, I've played with the software. Uh, but no, in this instance, of course, what determines this is quality of sleep and also recovery, which is indicated here from HRV. So most individuals, HRV has a set point and BASS, as you can see, would be deemed to be low. That's not indicative of his poor recovery, however, hence why his readiness score is high. So my HRV on a daily basis is about 120. That doesn't mean I'm like a superhero with recovery or anything like that by any means. That's just my set point. Um, that's also other variables that you know, contribute to this, so food sources, inflammation, lack of alcohol, uh, and monitoring, of course, recovery on a daily basis. But as you can see here, Bass is looking really, really positive. So that's sleep. But what, what do you guys want to dive into when it comes to sleep in terms of uh, protocols, supplementation? What questions do you guys have specifically pertaining to that variable? Go for it. In terms of what variable specifically? Uh, preferably one hour 30 to two hours. In this instance, as you can see, Bass is three hours, which is kind of superhuman levels, which is great. Um, most individuals won't be able to acquire that initially. But again, the variables that determine this, so obviously you reference that as being a goal, the variables that determine this are very much sleep duration. So if you're not spending eight to nine hours in bed, there's no way you can be able to acquire enough REM sleep. It simply won't be possible. 
And also furthering that, of course, your awake time as well. Make sure your awake time is as low as possible, okay? And again, to facilitate that, making sure your body temperature is within range is really important. So make sure you're sleeping in a cool environment, particularly as a male. If, you're, if you guys are guys, you're gonna be really hot at night, most individuals are. And therefore being in a cool environment is really important. Also making sure you actually manipulate your carbohydrate timing and meal timings appropriately to facilitate this is really helpful as well. So myself, for example, I'll show you guys an example of this as well. This is somewhat what my day looks like. And the reason why I'm referencing this now is because I incorporate my second meal at about 7 p.m. And that's all of my carbohydrates are consumed in this meal. So I consume about 400 grams of carbohydrates, which is quite a lot. But the reason being so is because as a result of that, from a, a nervous system perspective, I'm actually encouraging a rest and digest state. And therefore my sleep quality generally is a lot higher as a result of that. The reason why I incorporate that three hours prior to bed specifically is to ensure my body temperature isn't heightened prior to bed and I'm not digesting food as much as I would have been had I eaten closer to bed. Most individuals are eating basically as they're snacking whilst watching Netflix prior to bed. That's not particularly great when it comes to regulating body temperature. It's not good at all. Okay, and again, as a guy specifically, that's a really important variable. Girls less so, which is odd, but for guys specifically, it's really, really important to pay attention to. Okay, other variables that can of course increase awake time and impede your sleep quality are noise disturbances, light disturbances, sleeping with a partner, really important variables to pay attention to as well. Um, so from a noise perspective, of course, making sure that your living environment or your apartment wherever you're living is in a quiet space is great. You can also incorporate white noise filters if needed. If you're in a really urban environment, it's really beneficial to you. Um, when it comes to other variables like light, for example, sleeping with blackout blinds, no LED lights nearby, no tech in the room preferably is also really, really important. And those are the key variables to facilitate acquisition of REM. If you have difficulty acquiring REM, you've ticked all of those boxes, of course, incorporating further supplementation is great, like magnesium, zinc, L-theanine, et cetera. And I can dive into that for you guys in a second. But uh, most individuals jump to that way too quickly. They don't focus on the basics. The basics are really, really key. Um, and that's very much the primary emphasis of our work together in the first like week or so, first month or so specifically. So again, most individuals are like, what magnesium should I take? What should I be taking for this? Should I take melatonin, et cetera? And again, it's just the basics which are really key to facilitating this. Yeah? Furthering that. How much time do you um, usually for time bed? Nine hours. Yeah, to account for about an hour worth of awake time. Yeah, so as you can see here, Bass was asleep for eight hours, 57, but he spent yeah, a fairly long period of time in bed. So again, I spend nine hours in bed. So yeah. Hours in bed. Yeah. So this is actually a really accurate example of most awake times. Most individuals is about an hour, 30 minutes to an hour, like Bass, as you can see here, is 50 minutes. So again, he would have been asleep if he, was, if he spent nine hours in bed here, which he spent longer than. If he spent nine hours in bed, it would have been eight hours of sleep in total. Yeah. Just uh, curious, well, why not 10 hours? Sometimes I sleep eight, sometimes 10. Right? Bro, if you can do 10, do 10. Okay, yeah, yeah go for it. <laughs> ten, ten's quite a long period of time. Most individuals won't do that consistency, but yeah. If you can do 10, go for it, man. Yeah, absolutely. Is that normal? Is the week time normal for Say again. Is one hour more week time normal for you? That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Most individuals, if you guys hadn't wanted to improve your sleep quality, hadn't emphasized it previously, if you put an aura ring on now, it's probably closest to one hour and a half. Yeah, so be aware of that. In some instances, I've seen three hours, four hours, which is really appallingly bad. But to actually add to that point, there's another variable which contributes to awake time also. Uh, which is blood glucose. So again, if you guys aren't pre-diabetic or diabetic, you perhaps haven't tracked your blood glucose previously, which would make perfect sense. But uh, for certain individuals that are pre-diabetic, and again, generally speaking, you can kind of determine that based on their energy regulation and also their body composition. I've worked with quite a few guys that are fairly, fairly overweight. Um, and as a result of that, when it comes to their blood glucose, we do track that to make sure it's not an impeding variable. If it is, and their blood glucose is out of range and inconsistent, their wake time is really, really high. It can be about three hours, four hours per night without really knowing it. So again, paying attention to this is really important for all individuals, but you guys aren't out of shape, so that's fine. But other individuals are, and they've emphasized their business success over their health for years and years. So yeah, being aware of that is really important also, for sure. Go for it, man. Uh, is this more about you know, having that time in bed when I'm hearing like eight, nine hours, that sounds very high to me from what I do. Is this more about like discipline and kind of training yourself up. My mind's terrible. I spend about six hours and change in bed, but I feel great. I mean, I probably would feel better if I slept. You feel a lot better, bro. Yeah, probably would do. Probably yeah. Better, but is it, I, I physically do not get that tired yeah. until very late. And no matter what time I go to sleep, even when I implement these measures, I get up early, my body just wakes me up. 
Yeah, when most individuals refer to not wanting to go to bed early enough, it's generally as a result of their poor habits, which have led to that and contributed to it. So, let overactive. Overactive mind. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I mean, that's definitely one variable. But again, if you were to actually leverage your biochemistry properly, properly then that wouldn't necessarily be the case. So what I mean by that, for example, is most individuals wake up and they stroll straight to their desk, take a Zoom meeting, whatever it may be. That's the last thing you should be doing, pref well, preferably in an ideal world. If you're going outside and exposing yourself to natural sunlight first thing upon waking to establish consistent sleep starts and end times, that's key. If you were to do that naturally, of course, as it gets darker, your body's going to be inclined to want to go to bed and go to sleep. And therefore, as a result, your mind starts to switch off somewhat. Also, for me personally, that's why I incorporate my carbohydrate intake here. Because again, otherwise, yes, I would be working those hours. I'd want to be pushing for business growth and success. But if I have my carbohydrate intake here, I'm done. I'm tapped out, like that's me done for the evening. I can't work, I can't function let, cognitively, let alone in terms of the energy aspect of that. So for me, that's a really good kind of precursor to determining that. And then also in the hours prior to, then it means I can incorporate something which is a little bit more active, like going for a walk potentially, uh, sauna use, whatever it may be, just to make sure I, I'm somewhat unwinding and processing thoughts for the day. That's really beneficial. Again, not always possible, of course. There are, well, are days that's inconsistent, but preferably that's what you would adhere to for sure. Go for it, man. How many hours I, I sip on water throughout, but I front load my water intake because otherwise I'm going to the bathroom throughout the night, which isn't great. Um, so in this instance, I consume about three and a half liters of water per day. So it's fairly high, given my activity and energy expenditure. But uh, in, in that respect, I, I primarily consume about one and a half liters from 6 p.m. onwards, not much more than that. So I'm still sipping at that point. Except for the fact of waking up during the night to go to pee. Yeah. And then sleeping again. It's not the same as living eight hours, but straight. No, of course not. No. Definitely not. No, no, no. And that's going to definitely impede your quality of REM sleep also. So again, as you can see here, with Bass's duration of sleep, or if we reflect upon all of this, there's no wake time in this middle section whatsoever. There may have been a disturbance here. Potentially Danny got up. I don't know, maybe Noko barked. Whatever happened. <laughs> uh, but there's a disturbance here. And as a result, if, let's say, for example, Bass were to go to the bathroom here, again, his ability to acquire REM sleep wouldn't have been so substantial. So yeah, it is really important, definitely. Definitely, definitely. But yeah, I, I speak to, obviously I work with business people specifically. They all complain about an overactive mind and I understand that. Yeah, you guys have got those ruminating thoughts, stress, you're, you know, you've got employees, you've got people to pay for, etc. That makes sense, definitely. But at the same time, acknowledging that you can control that is really important. So for myself personally, and for the individuals that I've also worked with that are the most successful financially, um, these guys incorporate very strict evening routines in which they switch off from work, whether it be 6 p.m., 7 p.m., no late calls, etc. Also manipulation of macronutrients, so again, carbohydrate-laden uh, evening meals is really preferable. But uh, furthering that from a psychological perspective, a lot of the guys that I work to go to some form of therapy, which I actually find to be really beneficial for them as well, and I've seen that firsthand. Uh, to reference an individual, I, actually I won't mention their name, but yeah, there's an individual who's gone from like 50k a month plus very quickly, who's, uh, who's done that very successfully. So I think that, that helps in deal with ruminating thoughts, stress, and uh, feeling somewhat alone if you're running your own business, I think it's really helpful for sure. So I would very much encourage it, encourage it. But again, in the evening, I go to the sauna. I can process the thoughts of the day as well. I do two 15 minute blocks with a cold shower in between. Um, yes, it's beneficial from a health perspective, but for me personally, it's just unwinding and decompressing, which I find it really beneficial for. But also, yeah, it raises your core body temperature. You expel body heat and therefore you are cooler at night as well. So again, if you guys are hot at night, you're agitated, you're rolling around, you're sweaty, that could be beneficial also. You can also incorporate uh, bed jets and eight sleep pod pro. I don't know if you guys have seen this before. But uh, yeah, if you guys have got difficulty with that, you can use uh, products like this, which are really, really cool. And they're somewhat new, but uh, yeah, as a result, you can actually control the, the temperature in your bed and also change that. Yeah, I do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can either incorporate that or a bed jet. The bed jet is a little bit more invasive, in my opinion. Uh, I don't think the tech, uh, the bed jet specifically, the product is a little bit more invasive, in my opinion. I've used both. Um, and my partner didn't like it. So yeah, it, you, you have to bear that in mind also. But the 8 Sleep Pod Pro is really, really cool. Really enjoy that product. Yeah, so one thing I was going to ask actually is like, what do you think about mattress, mattress quality? Yeah, I mean, that is an important variable. I do think people overemphasize that somewhat though. Because if, for example, you don't have any physical fatigue or injury, or let's say uh, you feel a little bit tight and sore as a result of sleeping, then in my opinion, your mattress could be okay, could be absolutely fine. The temperature will be the key variable which would contribute to that. So yeah, buying a mattress like this is great, but like an orthopedic mattress, whatever it may be, that's not the be all or end all by any means. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Go for it, man. What temperature would you recommend sleeping in? What temperature would you put uh, your mattress on? That's a great question. If you can control it, 18 degrees Celsius would be preferable. Sorry, Fahrenheit would be preferable, definitely. 18 degrees, what is the best 
yeah, like in the in the hotel, for example, the air conditioning, you can set that to 18 degrees. Like I did that last night and it improved quality pretty drastically. But yeah, you can do that. But also you need to bear in mind that, again, air conditioning is artificial and therefore individuals have sore throats as a result of that as well. Uh, where's Nick? I know Nick experiences that. Um, so yeah, if you guys can obviously make sure you have a more open environment where you've got the door open, for example, in the winter months, whatever it may be, that can be preferable as well. But a product like this is kind of the great alternative to that. And I would very much recommend it. Definitely. Say again. Yeah, yeah, definitely, man. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it should be worth the price, of course, given the price. It's pretty expensive, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I oh, know that's the irritating thing about these products, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was actually asking the same same question as him in that, like, I could literally, I mean, 4.30, I'm up. It doesn't matter what time I go to sleep. I was up today at 4, 4, 4 o'clock. Like, I don't know, I could go to sleep at at uh, seven, I'll probably wake up, me, you know, a couple times, and like, uh, it, it's still like, I, no matter how early I go to sleep, I'm still gonna get only maybe five hours of sleep. I'll have to have a look at your metrics to actually, you know, look at that specifically and give you context for that. Um, without doing so, I won't be able to give you much of a summary for that. But I'm, I'm happy to check them out this evening, man, for sure. Cool. Yeah, and if I go to sleep at like midnight, like it doesn't matter. I'm up at four thirty or whatever. So yeah, we'll have to look into that. We'll have to look into that. After obviously assess other variables that contribute to that, like just habit, habitual aspect of things as well, like sunlight exposure, etc. Definitely. But we'll have to pay attention to that for sure. Okay. Um, everyone here is, is quite young uh, in relative essence. Um, <laughs> the reason I say it is I have two kids. Yeah. I have a three year old yeah. who uh, is in my bedroom. Okay. How do, you, how do you, or as a business owner and also a coach, navigate that with your clients? Because now everyone is 22, 23. For sure. I mean, I don't have kids, obviously. Yeah. So taking that into account, I can't really comment from the perspective of having kids in the bedroom or not. Yeah, yeah. It's not an experience I've had. Um, I wouldn't encourage it necessarily, of course, in terms of sleep quality. And I take don't encourage it either, but for the work in the Yeah, no, I know, man. I mean, that depends on your, obviously your relationship with your partner and obviously the, the child specifically. I have business owners, friends of mine that, like, you know, will go and sleep in different bedrooms and stuff like that, but then that's a real effect of obviously your relationship and everything else that goes with that. So yeah, for sure. I'm just interested to know, like, because not all your clients are obviously 21, 22 years of age. I'm sure you have guys that are 40, 50, 30, 35, whatever. Yeah, and they do have children, yeah, and their sleep quality, generally speaking, is worse, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that, again, that, that's determined by the variables they control and also their, the dynamic of the relationship specifically, right? So preferably, yes, they would be in a more quiet environment, definitely, and they'd have more set schedules. Individuals can have difficulty with that, definitely. And uh, it's very much... Say to my partner right here, right now, yeah. hey, I'm going to go sleep in my own bedroom. I'm going to get 10 hours. Wouldn't go down well. Yeah, she's going to say, you aren't going to fuck. Yeah. <laughs> so how do, you, how do you guys navigate? They still that? sleep in the same environment as their partner. Yeah. They're still in the same room, man. But generally speaking, they've got a fairly spacious bed. But their, their babies definitely don't sleep in the same room as them. Their kids definitely don't. Yeah, it's kind of like a rule we implement. The same with pets. Yeah, don't have pets in a bed. Dogs in your bed. Your awake time will skyrocket, so don't do that preferably. Yeah, but again, I can't really comment on the kids aspect of things because... You know, that's interpersonal relationships, and I, I haven't had that experience myself. Um, when it comes to other variables to pay attention to, also, uh, obviously nutrition is a really key variable for most individuals, and they somewhat overcomplicate that, in my opinion. Um, if you do have digestive health issues, generally speaking, something is wrong. Um, it could be obviously accumulation of stress, or it could be food sources which are inflammatory in your guts, and therefore getting a gut health testing kit done would be great. So I'm sure you guys have heard of Viome. There's other companies that operate as well. Uh, but Viome is a great company to be working with uh, or to get a testing kit from. It costs about $150. It's not particularly expensive. Um, you can get prebiotics and probiotics from them to obviously work on and develop your gut health. But uh, as you can see here, for this individual specifically, we've got food source groups. So superfoods, enjoy, minimize, and avoid. And for those of you that have kind of leveraged the carnivore diet previously and had success with it or something similar to that where you kind of remove food sources, the reason why I've had benefit from that when it comes to digestive health and energy potentially is of course not consuming inflammatory food sources or removing them entirely, okay? However, uh, the carnivore diet specifically, you do need to pay attention to based on cholesterol, HDL and LDL specifically, and just cholesterol in general. So for example, I adhered to the carnivore diet for a fairly significant period of time, as of late, just to test it out and see what impact it had on my performance and also physically. Um, and as you guys can see here from my blood work, if I pull up my HDL and LDL, they both skyrocketed really, skyrocketed really quickly as a result of increase in saturated fat intake. So bearing this in mind is really important for longevity and health span and cardiovascular health, particularly if you're at risk of having disease-related disease issues from a hereditary and genetic perspective like myself. Okay, well, go for it, man. Yeah, what diet do you recommend and what diet do you follow? Again, man, there's no set diet. 
I don't recommend set diets by any means. Uh, for all individuals we work with, we incorporate a gut health testing kit. And in terms of their caloric intake and macronutrient intake, it's personalized based on their physique related goals, whether it be weight loss, weight gain, maintenance of weight, etc. And uh, from a meal timing perspective, again, which is another really important variable, it depends on their work related stresses and the amount of food they're consuming on a daily basis. Okay. No, 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 it depends on energy expenditure. So anyone that tells you that thermodynamics does not apply to weight loss or weight gain is chatting shit. It does. So food intake and obviously energy output, that's really important variables. So for myself, for example, I'm currently weighing in about 190 pounds fasted. I consume 3,200 calories per day. So it's 400 carb, 190 protein, and about 85 grams worth of fat consumed across two meals. So again, my first meal is fats and proteins biased. Second meal, more carbohydrate based. Um, other individuals wouldn't be able to consume that same amount of food at that, in two meals. They'd have to break it down into three potentially, but I've, I'm fairly used to it now. And from a digestive perspective, it's all good. But uh, yeah, taking those variables into account as well, based on your energy expenditure, training frequency, weight. No, man, fats and proteins, first meal. So I consume about a thousand calories worth of just fats and proteins. So typically speaking, it's, it's actually fairly high in protein content. So about 100 grams worth of protein, and about 40 grams worth of fat in that one meal. Red meats, white meats, fat sources that I know from my gut health testing kit I can actually consume and cook in as well. Uh, fibrous green vegetables also for fiber intake. Really simple stuff. Do you eat red meat every day? Not every day, man. No. Hence why my LDL and HDL were too high. Yeah, yeah. Based on the carnivore diet previously. Yeah, yeah. But you can incorporate other fat, uh, protein sources like chickens, other meats, etc. Fishes as well. I eat it's 2 p.m. I consume that meal. Yeah, yeah. I don't. Yeah. I fast until 2 p.m. And I, I'd encourage that for most individuals. Definitely. Unless they have difficulty with that from a, a perspective of actually adhering to it, from a digestive perspective, but also from a perspective of caloric intake. Some individuals have difficulty adhering to this and therefore more frequent meals, they actually prefer from a satiety perspective as well. So taking that into account is really important. That's why there's no blanket approach for any of this. It has to have individual nuance based on people's um, understanding of things psychologically and also actual implementation to their life. Definitely. Go for it. <laughs> sleep sleep yes <laughs> yeah no that's the absolute foundation um any individual that doesn't prioritize that and prioritize other things is shooting themselves in the foot for sure 10 a.m to get it done otherwise if i don't do that and i have evening meetings or afternoon meetings it starts to pile up i won't work out i won't train so yeah that depends go for it guys Yeah. Obviously, this whole movement around consuming uh, red meat. Mm -hmm. uh, what if you don't do carnivore? I mean, you have carbs, you have fats. Yeah. But your main source of protein is, is red meat. Have you have you still so, uh, seen those like indicators? Yeah. Like the, the HDL and LDL. Any, any cholesterol? Yeah, so I was still incorporating carbohydrates, but from a meat source perspective, it was very much carnivore, carnivore based red meats, high intake of red meats and saturated okay, fat. Okay. So again, yes, and that still happened. Yeah. But again, that can also be, there's the individual aspect of that in terms of your response. But also even Paul Saladino, if you watch any of his podcasts or content specifically, he references the fact that HDL and LDL cholesterol is ridiculously high frequently. Yeah, I don't think it's particularly healthy. <laughs> no, no, no. But he, he, he says that very, very openly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but then what, what's your argument against the fact that, like, for example, fish is, is very high typically in, in metals, right? Yeah, it can be. Um, it, yeah, it can be, man. So you can also get heavy metal tests if you were to feel any symptom of that, definitely. What are your go-to sources of protein then? Is it mainly like chicken when it comes to white meats? Yeah, and grass-fed meats and beef. Yeah, from the fresh butchers. I've got butchers nearby my flat, which is helpful. Okay. Yeah, I still prepare my own food, personally. So what would you say like in a typical week? What are the, the protein? Sources? Red meats, white meats, fishes, so this is the basics. Week, example, in terms of red meat consumption, I'm currently consuming it four times per week. Yeah, whereas previously it was every single day. Okay. Yeah, so I have to be aware of that. But also, if, for example, this is a variable which I don't pay attention to, my grandfather, for example, had five heart attacks, right? And obviously other lifestyle variables contributed to that. But without this information from him, I'm somewhat conscious of that. So therefore, paying attention now is also really important, in my opinion, to obviously mitigating cardiovascular disease long term. And the red meats, what do they look like? Is it lamb? Is it lamb, beef, a lot of steak. A lot of steak. Yeah, I do love my steak. It's very easy to, cook, to consume as well and cook, for sure. But yes, being aware of that is really important. Again, if that were to be a long-term difficulty or issue, so let's say I'm 40, 
and uh, I hadn't really controlled this or 50, I'd incorporate some form of statin potentially to actually reduce this as well. But uh, being aware of this now is really great. Hence why I would encourage all of you guys to get your blood work done. Um, I understand that some individuals based on their location have difficulty doing so. Um, so for example, if you're based in Canada, it's almost impossible to get your blood work done, which is absolutely nuts. So I've got clients, uh, the Xavier twins, if you guys know them, Eric and Brian, uh, they had to go for a requ requisition in Canada. One of them was declined for the requisition and therefore wasn't allowed to get their blood work done, which was kind of nuts. And uh, Eric, he was able to get his blood work done, but it cost a thousand dollars just for one test, which is absolutely crazy. Whereas in the UK, this is readily available. It's 150 to 250 pounds, the same in Portugal here as well. So yeah, getting it done early is good. It gives you a good indicator. But also if you're, if you're male, for example, and uh, you want to know where your hormone profile is at or your testosterone. So for example, when I get to 40, 50 and I've had kids, I will use exogenous testosterone. I'll go on TRT for sure in a therapeutic level. Um, and I want to know where my testosterone is at now, just so I get a baseline understanding of when I was 24, I felt really good. I want to get back there through exogenous use. So now, of course, I, I get my blood work done frequently to see that as well. And it's a good reflection of, of all these variables. It's really good. It's like a long-term insurance policy, effectively. Go for it, man. Have you got any intolerance or allergy? Say again? Have you got any intolerance or allergy? Yeah, plenty of things. Plenty of things, man. Again, like in this instance here, this is an individual that I work with. You can see the food sources that have been told to minimize and avoid. It's pretty expansive. Based on their gut health and microbiome makeup. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's terrifying, right, for most individuals. But uh, again, you can, you can also use biofeedback or your own anecdotal feedback in terms of whether or not you can consume these food sources. If, for example, you get an indication from a gut health testing company that they say you should minimise the food source or avoid it entirely, and you consume it and you feel fine, no digestive health issues or any negative experience as a result, I'd say you can still consume it, definitely. So using that biofeedback and your kind of self-experimentation is really important as well, in my opinion. Definitely. Go for it. In terms of the daily basis, yeah, the only variable that's changed is my... Uh, about six years. six years. Yeah, more or less. And how many times per week are you eating the uh, uh, three times, Three to four times per week right now. Three to four times per week. Yeah. In terms of the implementation of fasting specifically, and again, this is where it comes back to kind of my experience of working with other individuals as well, the person that I saw leverage that the most and had the most success from doing so at a young age was definitely Iman, for sure. Like he was doing this from the age of 17. He was really, really young when he was incorporating this and he was so strict with it to the extent where evening or afternoon meals, if he went for a friend or like a, a lunch with people, he wouldn't consume any carbohydrates at all. He was so strict with his regimen and protocol. And he was doing his gut health work at 17, 18, really on it. Were you like the Iman, for example, he's drinking alcohol? Now. Or or... Now he is, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's all over social media. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, previously, it definitely wasn't. No, in the years in which he grew the most, and arguably built a foundation when I was with him in London as well. So prior to moving to Dubai, he, there was no drinking, no alcohol consumption, unless it was in the summer. And every now and then, he would. There's definitely no uh, cigar smoking or anything like this. He was very on top of his health at that point, for sure. Arguably, to the extent where it was very obsessive, but also obviously facilitated a lot of growth and success at the same time. Definitely, go for it. Classic question. Everyone jumps to that. Um, again, it's based on your blood work, man. So some individuals have deficiencies from like an immune function perspective or just, for example, here with Bionic, I get my supplementation personalized based on my bloods. So for example, one variable I pay attention to is vitamin D. My vitamin D is really low, being based in the UK, and of course it's the winter, it's fairly depressing. Other variables like light metals like zinc, magnesium, etc., also you should be aware of. Um, and I mean, it's the extent where, for example, my vitamin B, B12 specifically, was really, really high. The reason being for this was because the, uh, the pre-workout I was taking at the time was too high in vitamin B. And as a result of that, I wasn't aware of that unless I had my blood work done. So I actually removed that entirely. So being aware of these variables, again, and not supplementing blindly is also really important and beneficial to immune function, of course, longevity, long term. And also just not, make sure you don't get sick. It's really important. Whereas if you spend, you know, hundreds of pounds of supplements, you don't know what they're doing. That's not particularly great, if, particularly if you don't know how you're actually digesting and utilizing them properly based on your own biochemistry and how you're actually responding to that supplementation. It's pointless. So get your bloods done and then you can incorporate personalized supplementation. There's plenty of companies that offer it. I just personally happen to work with this company because they're based in London and I really enjoy it. But yeah, if you guys were to work with any company, you can get your blood work done in any clinic worldwide. All you need to do is, um, I can send you guys a list of parameters to test for as well. There's about 55 biomarkers. All you need to do is get these tested and you can send it off to any personalized supplementation company that'll do it for you on your behalf. 
So yeah, it's not particularly expensive. It's kind of cheap and cheerful, but it does everything you'd want it to do. I think you said you could do it through Bionic, right? Yeah, I do it through Bionic, but the testing facilities are only in London, specifically the clinics. But for example, Bass, and obviously the clinic nearby here is like three minutes away walk. You can get these same test work done and then send it off to Bionic and they personalize supplementation from there. Yeah, or any other company. I'm just, it doesn't need to be that company specifically. Yeah, go for it, man. Uh, I don't know if it's outside of the scope of this, but um, so obviously the fasting you recommend. I've been fasting for several years until about 2 p.m. Mm. Do you think we give up a lot of uh, muscle protein synthesis by having the two meals as opposed to like four or five a day? Uh, it depends what your goal is, bro. Are you wanting to be a bodybuilder at 250 pounds? <laughs> Then, yeah, again, it's one of those variables which you're, you're sacrificing certain elements for other benefits. So, yeah, for myself personally, it's worth the, worth the sacrifice, definitely. Yeah. Go for it. Like, honestly, I think maybe you mentioned it, but at one time we go to bed. Is it like a good time where you have like a sweet spot like go to 10 a.m. in bed and then 6 a.m. you wake up, or it's just totally up to you? Like, it's totally up to you. It's very individual. So, again, Individuals tend to believe they have like a set chronotype, which I don't actually massively support. So bear, wolf, dolphin, etc. I don't absolutely support that by any means. You can manipulate this based on other variables like light exposure, and of course, it's meal frequency, timing, etc. Also, temperature regulation is really important to, to, to actually determine this. So those that believe they're not a morning person, they can be if they manipulate those variables. It will take some time, it will take some adjustment. But uh, yeah, establishing consistency in that respect is really beneficial, really, really important. Go for it, man. Yeah. I've never done it before. Um, would you say, is it worth doing that a month later or something like that again before you get um, you know, the supplementation done, like personalized to whatever the outcome was? No, no, you can still personalize it on the first test, for sure. Okay. But in terms of frequency of blood work, if you want to be really accurate um, and also see whether or not supplementation is beneficial to you based on the exact dosages and amounts, um, every three months or so would be great. But also you want to take into account other variables. So for example, if you've manipulated diet and consumption of food sources, and yes, blood work frequently is beneficial. I personally do it every three months. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So for example, when I got my last blood works done, that was like November, maybe start of December. I've been to Dubai since. So maybe my vitamin D has increased naturally as a result. And also supplementation it has, yes. So being aware of that is really important. Yeah. Thanks. What else you guys want to dive into? Is there any other questions specifically pertaining to Go for it, man. Yeah, so uh, I was talking to um, my performance coach in uh, Netherlands as well. Yeah. Maybe you know, is it Jorn Kirkels? Yeah. Yeah, so he recommended basically to sleep for seven and a half hours. Uh -huh. Because you have five frames of one and a half hours. Um, I don't know what it was exactly, but. Uh, He's referencing sleep cycles. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, would you recommend that? Or? No. No? No. So, I mean, you can, this speaks volumes in this instance immediately. So you can see duration of sleep and of course sleep quality as a result of that. Um, I can pull up an individual that slept for seven and a half hours and you can see their quality of sleep as a result of this. It won't be as high by any means. So uh, yeah, it, you can't negate basic principles and sleep duration is one of the really important variables to facilitating good sleep quality. Yeah, it'd be great if you could hack it, but doesn't it actually exist? Supplementation can improve it and of course regulation of temperature, light, etc. But there are no like hacks in which you sleep four hours and you feel like a superhero that doesn't exist, doesn't work like that. You can incorporate polyphasic sleeping cycles and whatnot, but yeah, whether or not they benefit you is, is different. Do you think we just fake it then if that's the case? Um, meaning like, I know one of the gentlemen saying he doesn't need a lot of hours sleep. Is it just because we've become so, I suppose, normalized to the idea of not having a lot of sleep that we don't really know what it's like to have a lot of sleep? Yeah, so, I mean, potentially. So for example, when I was doing PT, I was waking up at like 5 a.m., I'd get in for six and I'd finish work at 9 p.m. or 10. So I was barely sleeping and I convinced myself that I was feeling okay. The reality is if I reflect upon that, that was terrible. But also from a, a, like just a health perspective in terms of body composition, regulation of, of glucose as well, it was just terrible, it was appallingly bad. Um, one thing I would like to add though is that it, having variables like this is really important when it comes to, of course, determining consistencies and trends and patterns and improving quality of health and sleep. But it's not something that you should obsess about to the extent where you wake up and immediately look at your aura ring. Do not do that, it's terrible, it's such a bad, psychological perspective to have on this. So I, I'm aware of plenty of individuals that wake up, immediately look at their aura. If it's like a 60 readiness score or sleep score, they basically cry and throw a fit. And then their day is ruined. Don't do that. Like if you want to look at your sleep metrics from a consistent variable or in terms of like on a daily basis, do it in the evening once you've got your work done and don't use this bias in terms of uh, feedback to determine how you feel cognitively or how you feel with the day in terms of emotional regulation, etc. It's a really bad way to live. It's, it's horrible. It's a very vicious feedback loop.
you're dealing with entrepreneurs who will just work on numbers. Metro based. Yeah, I know. That's, that's why I'm saying it. That's why I'm saying it, man. Because I know plenty of people that operate on very low quality sleep and they tell me they feel really good. But I actually, I agree with the principle of them telling themselves that, even if they aren't actually aware of these variables, because at least they still get things done. Right, was if they had to sleep six hours and tell themselves they feel crap, they won't get anything done and it won't improve at all. So I stopped charging this because they told me that I was uh, not ready when I, my little girl was one or six. <laughs> yeah. I just stopped charging because they just planted a bad seed. Yeah, yeah. So again, it's like, it depends on the person and of course their response to that. I personally find it's really beneficial as a tool. Yeah. It's not something which determines my quality of life. It's just a tool. Um, and that's how it should be seen in my opinion. It's, it's not reflective of your bank account balance, is it? It's reflective of your sleep quality and you can improve that consistently moving forward, of course. So it's not something which you should have an identity attached to, in my opinion. And you should be able to work if, even if you are somewhat sleep deprived, have bad quality sleep for one day or two days, you should be able to get on and, and function still for sure. Yeah. Um, any, have you guys got any questions on training specifically? Were you guys pretty clear in that respect? Go for it, man. What, to improve physique and build muscle tissue yeah, as natural? Muscle. Yeah, as a natural lifter, no. <laughs> um, high frequency in terms of training would be pre a preferential. So for example, this is George, who works for Bass. Um, this is current training protocols. So he's training five days per week. And of course, I can monitor his recovery from his aura ring, which is great. So I can actually manipulate his volume in accordance to his recovery and based on his feedback also. Um, in terms of my own training, personally, I train every body part twice per week. And in terms of application of volume, it's about 14 to 16 working sets per muscle group per week. Um, if I'm recovering well, I'm performing well, and therefore my strengths are uh, actually obviously growing and scaling in that respect, I can increase my volume. But again, that's dependent on my performance in the gym and how I feel. Yeah, so some, something similar to like a push-pull leg split would be preferable for sure in, in most instances. You can do, man. It depends on what your physique goal is, of course. So for me personally, I'd rather apply tension more effectively and therefore my training would be somewhat boring. I mean, you can see here, for example, George, he's got on the top left a seated cuffed clavicular pec fly, which sounds really complicated. That's just a machine based movement to apply to apply tension really well. He's not incorporating many movements like dips or anything like this, because, again, the ability to overload there is somewhat limited. Right, whereas if you can incorporate movements which you can overload more specifically and apply tension well, then that's preferable and, of course, reduces the risk of injury as well. So. Yeah, it depends on the person, their preferences. There's no absolutes. Again, it just depends on their, their perspective and how seriously they want to take this, really. Go for it, man. Uh, do you recommend a specific amount of stretching? Um, no. No, no, no. <laughs> no, not at all. What, to improve your mobility? Uh, or, you know, just get rid of uh, muscle tension, things like that. No, I just go for a massage every week. Sports physio massage every week. It's like maintenance of my body. Really? No. <laughs> It's an hour a week. Yeah, but you have to. Okay, I mean, all right. So if you did want to get a massage every single week, would you recommend? I wouldn't incorporate static stretching. I think the benefits are limited for sure. And you can incorporate some form of yoga work if you wanted to do so. I just don't find that preferable. For me personally, I'd rather be in and out within 60 minutes for my sessions and then get, get back to work, which I deem to be the most important thing. And uh, once that's done, I just incorporate a massage every week for recovery. Because generally speaking, the tension arises in my traps and rhomboid area here. And as a result of that, I can't stretch that area unless I'm doing like static holds or stretches, for example, in a pull-up bar, which again, the benefit from that can be limited. It's, it's beneficial, of course, but I'd much rather have like a, a masseuse or a therapist actually come in and take the knots out, which is really painful, or at least work on that area of tension. So yeah, that, that's my preference. Go for it, man. What's your take on like massage counts, like for recovery after training, day after training, you, like, you feel like, what's your take on that? Uh, I deem it to be somewhat of a gimmick. I think there's limited evidence to support the benefit of that, for sure. And it's a relatively new product. In the same way that majority of the health space is new products coming out every now and then, you see guys like intra, intra set, literally using a Theragun. Like, I believe the benefits be very limited. Yeah, but of course, if you have knots and tension in a certain area, any form of tension applied to that well will benefit you. So that could benefit you. Say again? Yeah, it does. It does, definitely. But I personally wouldn't deem it to be like the be-all or end-all tool. I'd much rather go to a sports therapist and get their expertise on that, definitely. Yeah. How much are you in? Are you getting? Two sessions per week. Yeah, so I, I'm working my aerobic base. Say again? Are you training those days? No, so I incorporate that on my rest days. So as you can see here for George, we, if I were to implement that there, I'd incorporate that on a Thursday and a Sunday, which is very similar to what I adhere to. Um, in terms of that aspect of things, I come from a very like athletic background. So I played tennis nationally and cross country when I was a kid. And I was obsessed with athletic and endurance sports. Um, so in terms of maintaining that aspect and my aerobic base, I incorporate two sessions per week. And they're about 40 to 60 minutes in duration. 
My heart rate's about 150 BPM. So I'm using the Mathetone method there, which if you guys are like into sports and fitness, you would have heard of before. Basically, I'm detracting my age from what would be 180 BPM, and therefore I'm training at that level to build my aerobic base. If I were incorporating like a half marathon prep, I'd incorporate anaerobic work as well. But given that I'm not, I just do two sessions for maintenance and obviously health as well. So it's mainly running? Uh, yeah, running or bike work. If I go on to, let's go on to Eric, for example. So Eric's currently incorporating half marathon prep. And therefore, based on this, as you can see here, he's incorporating easy runs, which is aerobic work. So that's an eight kilometer run at a heart rate of 150 BPM maintained. And we're working on improving his uh, cadence as well, his step count to improve or rather reduce the risk of injury. And also, as you can see on the, on the other day, for example, here we've got an easy run. Also on this day specifically, if I scroll down, we've got a, a higher intensity run, which is more tempo run based. So intervals, it's fairly decent length intervals, 800 meters, that's gonna suck. And he's not gonna enjoy that whatsoever, but uh, he's wanting to perform really well in the half marathon. Um, if, for example, of course, it doesn't need to be running work specifically you're incorporating, it can be static bike work. So as you can see here for Eric, um, based on the fact he's got a few lower body issues and injuries right now, which he's sustained from football, we do incorporate static bike work as well, just to take off load from the lower body. And uh, that's absolutely fine. The preference or the, right, the priority there is simply to get his heart rate to 150 BPM for that length of time. That's the priority. So you don't have a full day uh, rest day, right? No, personally not, no. But I wouldn't deem my aerobic work to be particularly taxing. And it doesn't reflect upon that in my, in my metrics either. So that's absolutely fine. It's only 40 minutes of 150 BPM. Easily hold a conversation throughout. It's fine. Yeah. Uh, it depends on what we're wanting to achieve. It has to be more specific. Or just, just do cardio and it doesn't matter if you want to stay on It doesn't matter what medium or what device you're using specifically or what tool. Again, it depends on what you're trying to achieve. If you're trying to build like aerobic base and obviously health in terms of how that translates, aerobic work's beneficial. You can incorporate some anaerobic work as well. But um, yeah, it depends. And obviously you have, to, you have to leverage cardio effectively in terms of it not pulling too much from you. So for example, what I mean by that is the brothers right now, the twins, they're actually prepping for a half marathon, therefore incorporating three to four cardio sessions per week into their training. That's going to detract from their sleep quality pretty substantially and their ability to feel energized daily because it's a massive tax and massive drain on their body and their system. OK, so it's something which if you guys were wanting to pursue athletic performance, I dip in, I dip out of it pretty quickly. Maybe incorporate a prep for half marathon for three months and after that, go back to your strength work as your base whilst maintaining an aerobic or aerobic work, sorry once or twice per week. Yeah, because these guys are gonna suffer for the next 10 weeks, basically, unfortunately. And they, they know that, they signed up for that effectively, but um, it's gonna reflect negatively on their sleep metrics for sure. I can actually show you guys if that's helpful. Yeah. yeah. I have asked for permission just to say, so I'm not just revealing loads of information about them, but. So Arik, for example, now he's incorporating his half marathon prep. That looks like a pretty decent metric, and it is. But uh, other nights as of late, his metrics have descended somewhat. So you can see here, for example, I mean, that's a bad example. Generally speaking, he was in the 90s at one point. So this is a, a good point, 95 readiness. But moving forward, his readiness will take a pretty substantial hit. Um, and this HRV and recovery will do also as a result of just simply how taxed his body will be. Um, also, anecdotally, or more, more so from a subjective perspective, He's referencing and telling me frequently about how lethargic he feels as a result of incorporating such extensive aerobic work and cardiovascular work. But uh, again, that's what he wanted to move forward with. I didn't actually encourage him to do that, but he did want to do a half marathon. So that's up to the individual. I've personally done half marathon preps before and uh, marathon preps before whilst also managing a business. And I would say it detracts pretty extensively from the business. So I wouldn't encourage it personally. Keep one focus, in my opinion. You can maintain quality of health, improve quality of health in other ways more effectively. But feeling like you have to sign up for a challenge like a half marathon or a marathon isn't necessary by any means. And most individuals do it in the new year. They get to January, they're like, oh, I'm going to do a marathon or a half marathon. But the reality is it's quite deleterious to their quality of health. It's really full -time job, really, it? Massively, man. Like the recovery aspect of that is significant, let alone the training aspect. Like the training duration of sessions is quite expansive. But then they have to incorporate further recovery, like, you know, cold water immersion, hot exposure, et cetera. So heat exposure, it's not great. Go for it. Mm -hmm. But I don't wear it during the day because I, I don't like you know, to, to have that on the thing all the time. Yeah. Um, what are like the benefits of wearing it during the day? I mean, it tracks the activity. Of very, li very limited. Is that the biggest benefit of the rings? Like, you just sleep like that's where it's 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah. No, definitely, man. There's no need to wear it throughout the day. I'm wearing it now because I'm speaking to you guys, but I don't wear it normally throughout the day at all. It does track activity and step count in that respect. So if you want to, of course, facilitate a weight loss goal or weight gain goal, you need to know your energy expenditure. That could be beneficial to you, but arguably an Apple Watch does exactly the same thing or an iPhone. So again, I personally don't like wearing jewellery. I'm only wearing this now because I'm speaking to you guys throughout the day. I don't wear this ever throughout the day normally. Uh, there's no need to actually track any metric data associated to that. If you wanted to get a reflection of, uh, for example, your meditative state and your heart rate throughout, you can do that through the app. But again, that's up to you guys. Cool. Yeah. You feel the Aura is the best? Because there's a lot of those. In terms of accuracy of data, yeah. I comparatively wore Whoop and Aura and an Apple Watch for about a year at the same time. In terms of accuracy of data, Aura is much better. Much, much better, man. The Whoop was really inaccurate. I just don't like the software either. I think the product looks badass. The way they market it looks really sick. They've done a much better job than Aura, but I think the quality of, of data here is much better. Much, much better. Anything else you guys can dive into? Any training related questions? Anything else? Or is that all pretty clear for now? When it comes to cold exposure, do you do that daily? Do you do cold plunges? Like... Yeah, not cold plunges because I don't have access to it currently, but um, cold water exposure in terms of cold showers, yes. Yeah, but I do that in between my sauna sessions just to cool my body temperature down, preferably. That's the primary emphasis. Again, it's not one of the things which you have to incorporate in order to win the day. But uh, yeah, if you wanted to shock yourself and actually feel a little bit more alert, then yes, you can incorporate that first thing upon waking, definitely. And it will mitigate inflammation, of course, and improve recovery to an extent, definitely. Yeah, go for it, man. Do you like uh, red light therapy or Yes. How yeah, I do. Do you go to the clinic Say again? Do you go to the clinic or how do you do that thing? No, I have my own panel. Um, I have my red light panel. Do you guys know what red light is? No. Huge problem with that. So, do I travel with it? Yeah. Bro, it's massive. It's like half the size of the whiteboard. No, definitely not. Can you imagine me going to the airport? I look like such a tool. Can you imagine? Uh, yeah, no, that, that's, this is Ajeev, this is the company that I purchased mine from. Um, I purchased mine about 2019, so for a while ago. Again, the evidence supporting the benefit of this product is somewhat new. Um, but from the perspective of just anecdotal feedback on that, I really do appreciate the tool and I use it first thing upon waking. I love how I feel as a result of incorporating it. My skin has definitely cleared up as a result also. And just in terms of my mitochondrial response, I feel like I feel more energized and better. Will that be subjective or just based on bias? I'm unaware, but nonetheless, I still feel benefit from it. But um, yeah, I have individuals that I work with that do incorporate this, individuals that don't, just simply based on choice and preference, it's not an absolute by any means. But yeah, I incorporate that for about 20 minutes first thing upon waking, just to get myself kind of kicked into gear a little bit more, because I'm a little bit kind of dazed first thing. So I incorporate this, and uh, I do this every single day, but I have my own panel, so I don't go to a clinic or anything for it. But yeah. Anything else you guys want to touch on? All pretty clear? Cool. Awesome, wrap it up there then, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, go for it. That's a good question, bro. Uh, yeah, DM. Just DM. Yeah, yeah. A, a lot. I'll, 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 in terms of from a business aspect of things, I was actually relatively lazy for a fairly extensive period of time. Um, I just relied on inbound for ages, for about two years. I mean, I lost my dad at the same time, so it's a bit difficult in terms of managing that aspect, but I just relied on inbound from YouTube for two years. Yeah, I was doing 30, 40K a month for that entire time period. So, yeah. Yeah, like, like Cole Gordon, for example. Yeah, that was purely from YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, and that, yeah, that's how it escalated pretty quickly. Bastion is. Yeah, we had in 2019. I found you through Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And how did you find Funny enough, I actually bumped into him for the first time when I was 18, he was 17, at um, a fitness expo, when he was doing all his fitness content, because he used to do that kind of stuff, and he was doing videography. Bumped into him, um, didn't actually get on with him at all at the day, which was funny, but anyway. Um, that happened, and then, yeah, as a result of that, I then dropped him a few DMs when he started to do well, and then we just went from there with it, really. Nice. Yeah. But yeah, cold, cold DM worked all the time, all the time for my offer, specifically. PT in London, or what do you do? Say again? Online. You still PT in London? All online, man. Online. All online. Yeah, yeah. We're launching a software aspect of it, but yeah. Awesome. Cool. Anything else?
Awesome. Leave it there then. I'll ask you. I saw recently a video where Elon said uh, that uh, he, he does, uh, what is it, monk mode. Mm -hmm. Like six months straight, just coming, just meat, salt, and water. Basically. Yeah. And like, what do you think about it? I don't agree with that at all. I don't agree with that at all, man. Again, if you were to get your blood work done, I think that would reflect pretty poorly. Definitely. Any individual that references that, if they reference an approach to diet specifically, which is somewhat extreme, if they don't show you support for their blood work, they shouldn't be speaking about it publicly, in my opinion. They should be showing that support for that from a perspective of how it's Im impacting their body. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, again, like, for example, I, I'd hit something similar in terms of red meat consumption. It wasn't the exact thing in terms of I was still incorporating carbohydrates. But as you can see, my cholesterol levels rose pretty drastically. And that's based on my, my blood work from previously as well. With a carnivore diet these days? Uh, excessive consumption of red meat, yes. Which is what's heavily predicated in the, in the carnivore diet, yes. Cool. Leave it there then, I guess. Awesome. <laughs>